Hey guys, what's up? This is Casey. And Coach Tom. And this is Shot Science Overtime number 184. Wow. <laughs> um, so, hey, look, we got people already. This The Flipsy says, yes. Hey, my name is Dog. Almost uh, first. All right. You almost got it. Yeah, so what's up, you guys? Uh, this is our live show that we do. Uh, Injustice Gaming says hello. Uh, this is our live show that we do. We like to get here and answer your guys' questions. This is not a regular video where we do like a tutorial or breakdown or anything like that. Those are all in our video library. If that's what you want to watch, go ahead and check it out. But we're here for about an hour, and we're going to talk to you guys about maybe answering some of your questions that you have about basketball or uh, talking, talking about topics that we think are going to help you become a better basketball player. Right. Um, so we hope that that's what you want to be here for. If it's not, that's okay. Go check out those other videos. Uh, make sure you guys are following us on all of our social media stuff. We are Shot Science on everything. Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat, Facebook, you <laughs> name it, we're there probably as Shot Science. And we're doing different things in different places, so make sure you're following all of that. Also check out ShotScience.com. It's where we have all of our cool stuff that is from Shot Science from us. You can get our Shot Science shirts, which we love to see on you guys. If we see it on social media and you have hashtag Team Shot Science, we'd like to feature those people. So if you want to get a shirt and do that, that is super awesome. We also have the jump box and other training gear there at right. ShotScience.com and the Shot Science All Access Pass. So if you want to check all that stuff out, the All Access Pass is great because it is our super in-depth training, drills, tutorial stuff that if you like our stuff on YouTube, you'll like that even more because yeah. it's, it's super broken down. Yeah. Anyways, looks like we're getting a bunch of people showing up. Yeah. Cool. Awesome. Uh, Mika is here. Clibin Cadet is here. Leah Saki. Leah Kisaki is here. Andres is here. Awesome, you guys. So great to see you guys. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to have a topic that we talk about here at the top of the show. So uh, it's something that we think is going to help you guys become better basketball players, maybe cut out some of the learning curve, and uh, just maybe help you take that step without going through all the hardship that yeah. you might, if you don't know about that stuff. Yeah. And then while we're doing that, you guys are sending us your questions. So anything basketball related, uh, shooting, passing, dribbling, defense, how to talk to your coach, athleticism, whatever, we will jump into answering those questions as soon as we're done mm -hmm. with our topic. Right. Helps us get a little bit of time for people to show up and uh, get us a few questions from you guys. So if you have questions, send them our way. And if you really want your question answered, hit up the super chat because apparently that's the new thing. Um, and we will answer anybody that does the super chat stuff. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. Before we get going, oh, okay. let's find out where everybody is from. Oh, you're jumping the gun on I'm me I'm jumping the gun on you today. Okay, so our question of the week is always, always, where in the world are you guys from? Exactly. We want to know. We're in Santa Cruz, California, which is south of San Francisco uh, and right on the coast. We want to know if you are from Japan, if you're from South Africa, if you're from... Lithuania. <laughs> <laughs> That's the go-to. Um, we want to know where you guys are from. Yeah, like we got Steven Swishker, who's from Philadelphia. Kavon Jones, who's from Baltimore. Jasminder Jodka, who's from India. Mika Malwitz, who's from Germany. Michael Simpson from Virginia. Nook Gilbert, Saskatchewan, Canada. Mino Pfeiffers, who's from the Netherlands. BK Productions 2013 is from Montana. Ahmed is from Turkey. Uh, Jasminder, we know you're from India. You've yeah, said it we, about 30 times. <laughs> um, Brian Perez Cruz is from uh, Oregon. Diego Barranco is from Mexico. Andre Sims is from San Francisco, not too far from us. Right. Uh, Ahmet is from Turkey. Yeah, we got you guys. Awesome. Right. So cool. if you guys so keep, cool. sending, keep sending us in where you guys are from, if you just got to the chat, please let us know. We'd love to see that. Uh, the Flipsy says from Antarctica. <laughs> A little cold down there. <laughs> Not a big hoop scene. Not I a think. good ball in place. Yeah. Um, but let us know where you guys are from. And if you have a town that has basketball going on, please go out, tell them about Shot Science Basketball, help them join the team so they can be awesome like you guys are. Um, <laughs> Eldon is from Slovenia. Okay. So our topic for today is how to develop deep range. So that's a topic that people are always interested in. They want to know, how do I hit those shots that are outside of what is kind of the mid-range mid -range, yeah. uh, area of the basketball court? So what are your thoughts on that one? You know, uh, one of the things that, that we get a lot of uh, uh, questions about is, uh, I shoot okay at the mid-range, but then when I move back, I can't shoot the ball. Um, it's not accurate. It's not, it's, the ball is flat. And there's a number of other things that go along with that, yeah, too. There's a lot of, lot of br breaking down that happens. It, Flat yeah, shots, yeah. bricks, air balls, right. you name it. And, and as the, the shot breaks down because of the added distance, 
one of the things that we tend to do is try to add power, but our power comes usually from the arms when we're trying to get that, uh, uh, overcome that range problem. Yeah, because you're trying to hoist it, yeah. compensate with your upper body instead of using your lower body. Yeah. And so one of the things that's really important is to make sure you understand how to use your lower body in connection with your stroke. Okay. Yeah. Let me jump in on Go that ahead. too. So when we talk about sh shooting methods and, and kind of our, our kind of uh, look on, on the methodology there, what we think is that you have to break it up into two different parts, yep. your lower body, your lower chain, kind of the core down through your legs, your butt, all of that stuff. That is your powerhouse, yeah. your power generator, and that's where you're going to get the the uh, the power required to get the ball from where you are to the basket. Exactly. Your upper body should not be doing that job as much as you can possibly, you know, take that away from it. Yeah. You want the upper body to be the fine focus, the delivery system, the way that you kind of dial in the accuracy. Exactly. If right. you're trying to use your upper body as the powerhouse, then you're sacrificing the accuracy. Yeah. And that's not what you want to do. One of the things that I see when people are kind of learning to shoot at a little further distance is they immediately drop the ball down below their shoulder and their elbow becomes a V and they are trying to hoist the ball with that added uh, um, uh, muscle and whatnot from the uh, uh, the arms. But like Casey says, that is the guidance system. Yep. It is not very much uh, uh, a power system. It represents about 20% of the total power that you generate when you're shooting the basketball. And so anyway, let's, let's move on with this. How can I improve my range of shooting? Well, one of the things that we always talk about is we think that you need to take and start working on gradual uh, lengthening of your shot. Progression. Yeah, it's a progression outward away from the basket. And you can take and go uh, anywhere around uh, the uh, three-point line, um, kind of in that same, uh, what's the word I'm trying to use? Distance? I mean... Uh, well, not the distance, but, you know, uh, if you're, if you're let's say you're shooting from 15 feet. Uh, shoot from 15 feet all the way around, and that's going to kind of that mirror range. that the uh, three-point range, okay? And then at, at one of the questions then becomes is, how much do I shoot? Well, you know, that kind of is uh, an interesting question in itself. If you're going to become better as a shooter, you need to spend a lot of time at it. And so if we're talking about uh, our form shooting drill, which if you haven't seen it, you might want to go look at that. Is that on ShotScience.com as well? Yep. We, okay. go, we have it on... Uh, our YouTube page, which we did many years ago, but if you go to shotscience.com, we have, and you join the all access area, we have it broken down yeah. and we show you very explicitly how to do the form shooting drill. Right, and the points that we shoot from are um, the blocks. We consider that's about seven feet. We move back to the first peg and that's about nine. And then we shoot right directly uh, at the basket from the middle of the key and that's about 11 feet more or less, okay? And so that particular shooting drill really helps us to dial in our shooting mechanics and it helps us to dial in the range. Yeah, I mean, okay. that's that's one of the things that when we're talking about developing range, you can't shoot the three footer yeah. and then jump back and shoot the 30 footer and think that the mechanics are gonna be there, everything's gonna be dialed in. Yeah. It doesn't work like that. No, no, you doesn't. have to take the time. I mean, that's yeah. that's just like people thinking that they can go and, and start doing a you know bench press and then the next week they can compete in the Mr. Olympia. That doesn't yeah. work like yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. You have to spend the time to work back to that range. Okay. So. It, it takes, uh, you know, using that form shooting drill, start out that close range, master that area, take a step back, master that, take a step back, master that. Eventually, you'll get to past that three-point three, range, three point line, and yeah. you'll be in kind of the, the deep range you're trying to develop, and you will have done the work to have all the, the mechanisms in place, have the right muscle memory, the right uh, kind of power generation, and you will be in a much better spot than if you just jump back and try to oh, shoot yeah, those shots. Yeah. It'll, it'll be a losing contest for you. One of the things that we would recommend as well, too, is this. And, is and, that, and the other bonus of that, too, is that you can shoot mid-range shots, too. Yes, yes. Um, and... So one of the things that we really like to have uh, students do is get to the point where they work themselves back, and it takes a while. It might one of the the form shooting drill goes kind of like this. I'll just give this a little rundown. We want you to make ten shots at those uh, five locations, and then when you get all the way around to the other side, then you work back. So you've got nine spots where you have made ninety shots. Yep. 
And the, the way we deal with that is those 90 shots have to look really good. Who do they have to look really good to? Well, they have to look good to you. And they have to be within the bounds of good shooting mechanics. <clears throat> you can't just throw them up there and, and, put them in, and count them just because they went in. We want them to look a certain way. And we, we talk about how to do that. Then as you work back, the mechanics all mm. remain the same. The guidance system is still going to do exactly the same thing. We're not going to have that elbow come back to a V. It's going to be L every time you shoot it. And so as we begin to work back, uh, then that's going to improve your shot. Now, if you make 90 of those shots, it probably in the beginning, it might take you 150 shots to make 90. But we know that after you have begun to really focus on this and get the right command, uh, uh, mechanics working for you, that you probably you'll see that upper number of uh, shots start to come back drastically as your yeah. shot gets better. And so instead of uh, to make 90, it takes 160 pretty soon, uh, probably just a couple of sessions, you'll find it'll fall right back to about 140 and then it'll fall back to 130 and maybe you're back to maybe 100, 120 shots to make 90 at that distance. And then, like Casey says, you actually can upgrade that uh, to a, a little more distance. When you go to the block, take one big step back and instead of going to the first peg, when you go to the lane, you go to the second peg and then right in front of the free throw line and then uh, the second peg and the, and and just outside the uh, the block on the other yeah, side. Yeah, if you guys want to see that illustrated, you can go to shotscience.com yeah. and, and we do that. Yeah. The other thing I will say is they need to be quality shots. Oh, yeah, absolutely. They can't just be casual shooting. Uh, let's put up a few shots. These are very purposeful, diligent. Uh, you're doing the the analytics on what you're you're doing. You're making sure you're, you have everything mm -hmm. in place. It's not shoot around. Yeah. yeah. Uh, this is very... Uh, very kind of uh, just purposeful work. Yeah. Um, and here's the other thing. Too. Oh, let's Alvaro Berdesto's from Spain. Right. Gerald Kuzar says, "Hey guys, Surya Surya Ramesh says, hey." And I think you also said, no, "Do you no. people have an Instagram page?" We do, Surya. Yeah. It's it's Shot Science. You, if you just go at Shot Science, that's us. So yeah. please let us know if you want to follow us there. Key Molin is from the Netherlands. Um, cool. And the flip says, "Damn, I wish you were my dad and my grandpa." <laughs> <laughs> well you can hang out well, with us on sundays for yeah, sure yeah hang out with us on sundays that'd um, be cool yeah okay so getting back to uh developing range okay so uh, this is the process so and you move back and you're shooting the ball about three feet further each time you get through one of these progressions until you get back to where casey's talking about you're shooting from the three-point line as you get there if you have not allowed your shot to become corrupted by uh, trying to muscle the ball, uh, the elbow coming to a V, it wants to stay at L all the time, and getting a nice release, you're going to find that the shot starts to come around for you. And the thing that's really important is that it, it takes time. Yeah, one of the things that people often think, uh, like Casey was saying a while ago, I'm just going to shoot around and work on my shot. Well, just shooting around and, and working on your shot is not the best plan for how to get it done. Yeah. We think that the form shooting drill and other drills like it uh, are really important in helping you develop the proper skills to not only shoot the ball, but then to develop range for your shot. Yeah. Everybody wants to shoot the three ball. You know, I can remember 100 years ago uh, when I was a young guy uh, playing high school and after, there was no three-point line. And, and it made basketball way more exciting uh, to see that three ball there. That, that, that's really, a, a, an, I think, an ingenious part of the game of basketball. It's yeah. really cool. Okay, so what are, what are the next things here? All right, so the thing that you want to think about is, is this, is that uh, as you begin to become more automatic in your shot, then you're going to become more familiar with what you need to do in getting the shot away. And so one of the things you would do to work on your range is maybe get somebody who's playing defense and they just step up to you and put a hand up to kind of contest the shot. Yeah. And so that gives you another element of shooting that you would re that you would have to be uh, facing when you're playing in a game situation. Okay, and then as you get going, then it's time now maybe to move to uh, shooting off the dribble. And this is an important part of uh, <clears throat> shooting that longer ball too, is to shoot off the dribble. Shooting off the dribble is... It's not something that people naturally do. You have to learn how to do it. And, you know, surprisingly, there's a lot of young players who have played for a while, and they have no jump shot either. And so 
what you want to do is get on the same program so that you're shooting a jump shot with the same mechanics and some people are strong enough they can shoot that three ball uh, out of a jump shot very effectively because they spend time on it. So that's the whole key, kind of the wrap up on what we're talking about is that you can improve your range, but it's how you go about it that is going to improve that range for you. And, uh, you know, one of the things I uh, read recently is that you might have to take a thousand shots uh, in the shorter range before you begin to get pretty uh, effective with that. Uh, and, you know, uh, that's just, you know, the way it is. If you're going to be a good shooter, you got to spend time on it. Yeah, everybody uh, wants... Hang on a second. I'm sorry, Casey. Uh, if you take and, and uh, uh, were to look into what um, uh, Cur uh, Stephen Curry does before every practice, he shoots a thousand shots before practice yeah. begins. A thousand shots. And you don't shoot that in 10 minutes. Yeah. And he's shooting quality shots. You know, you see him shoot a lot of different kinds of shots... And he works on those probably just as hard as he does that three ball. And so one of the things that's so important is uh, it takes time, work to get better. Okay? Yeah. And uh, th that's all the great players. They yeah. all they get there super early and they're working on their shooting and their, their execution way yeah. early. But they also did all the work before they even got to the arena, yeah. before they even were pro players. Yeah. So that's what we're trying to instill with you guys is that if you want these kind of results, you have to put in the work. There is no quick payoff. And no. if you hear somebody say, you know, watch this video and you'll become a great long distance shooter. Yeah. Sure, if the information's there and then you apply the information. Yeah. So just make sure that you're going about it the right way. It's a progression. It's not just, you know, an epiphany, you know. Okay. So is that good for that? Well, one more thing I'm okay. just kind of throw in. Uh, you know, one of the things important is when should you take and work on developing this range? Well, it's kind of too late if you're in season uh, because things are happening too quick there. Your team probably is spending a lot, a lot of time on offensive, defensive, press breaks, inbounds, and all that kind of stuff. And so there probably is not going to be practice time there for you to do it. So the best time is that time between season, like right now, getting started if, if you're out of right season. now. So that when the season rolls around uh, in November, uh, the first of November, then those mechanics are... Those skills are already set in place. You're ready to go. Yeah, and then you can do some polishing if you need to, and yeah. it's not like some diligent uh, kind of work to get it to where it needs to be. It's like you kind of just have to maintain it. Yeah. Okay, we're good. We're good. Okay, if you guys have more questions about that, let us know in the chat, and we'll try to answer those. We're going to transition into an uh, answering some of the questions that you guys sent to us. Remember, our question of the day is, where are you guys from? Oh, wow. We want to know where in the world you guys are from. Like we have Brian Kelly, who's here from Ireland. What's up, Brian? We have uh, Jean-Philippe, who's from France. We have Harry Stairs from Oakland, which is not too far from us. Uh -huh. And we have IA Gaming, who's from Morocco. All right. And okay. there's a whole bunch of other people that already said stuff that we uh, we said. Yeah. I think, uh, oh, here's on Dizan Jelovac, who's from Serbia. Um, so we appreciate you guys being here. Please let us know where you guys are from. Yeah. Oh, SYC is from Dubai. Right. Uh, MC Elias, who says Buenos Aires, Argentina. Wow, that's that's pretty far away too. Um, Chad Smith from South Carolina. Uh, that's awesome. Okay, so please send us those questions that you guys have on basketball stuff. We're going to try to get to as many of you as we can. Uh, if we don't get to you, we're very sorry. But if you get it in now, that's a that's a good thing. Also, try the super chat if you want to definitely get your question answered. Right. Okay, so let's go back here to some of the earlier ones. Oh, Andre Sim says, hey, Shot Science and Community. What's up? Um, Club and Cadets says, hi. Okay, uh, let's see. Lee Ak... This is the one, this name gets me every time, every week. <laughs> Lee Akisaki, who says, how often for how long should I practice? How much rest do I need? Well, you know. We can't tell you specifically that. Yeah, we can't. And, you know, it, it really breaks down into what kind of a commitment that you want to make, what time you have available for working on your game. And it might be different. If Casey were working on his and I'm working on mine, it probably would be really different. <laughs> So, uh, you, in fact, it'd be really different because mine would be a real short workout. Oh, boy. Okay. And the thing that is important is that uh, you get a plan for yourself that is not going to totally 
gas you out. In other words, make you super fatigued because you reach a point in uh, where fatigue begins to set in. And when fatigue begins to set in, then your quality of uh, practice begins to ebb really fast. And, and this, so, this is for skill development. Is, yes. And so it's important that you not overdo that. Okay. Yeah, and, and here's the thing is that you need to assess that a little bit, but one of the best things you can do is set up a practice yeah. that has kind of all the things that you want to touch on, that is very comprehensive, um, that is got that has good variety in it so that you can stay kind of mentally there because a lot of times what happens is, yes, you can fatigue physically where you are kind of not performing at your peak performance and it kind of has diminishing returns, but you right. can also do that mentally as well yeah where you, maybe you've done the same thing 500 times in a row now your mind isn't even concentrating on what you're doing and so you're starting to put errors into what you're doing and then you're teaching your muscles to do that over and over again yeah. that's not good either well we kind of call that mindless practice where you're doing it but you don't have any idea what the heck you're doing or how you're doing it so you never want to get into that mindless uh, uh practice situation always yeah. be really on top of what it is you want to do. One of the things I think is really good is that if you were going to say, okay, today I'm going to work out for an hour and a half and you take, give yourself a workout. And I think it's really a good idea to do it. So you don't miss anything. And you're going to go through this, 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 maybe there's five or six things that you're going to work on diligently that day. And then maybe the next day it is a different list of things that you're going to work on. Because one of the things that you can get into is just mental tedium if you do the same thing over and over and over every day. Yeah, and you know, the, the other thing too is consistency. You can't work out on Monday and expect your execution to be there on Saturday. Yeah. You have to work out Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, right. and then Saturday it will be there. Yeah. Because you always develop a little bit of rust no matter oh, what, yeah. Yeah, even do. to the next day. So you want to eliminate that as much as possible. Consistency is really a very important part of it. Okay. Um, okay. The next one there is uh, uh, Injustice. Which one? This one? Injustice uh, Gaming says, I need to get range on my shot. Any suggestions? Go you back just, and watch this yeah. video uh, uh, when it's posted, which will be posted what, this afternoon? Yeah. And uh, all that information that we've already covered, okay? Jasminder Jodka says, do Spurs still have a chance? No. <laughs> Yikes, I don't think so. No, no um, they don't. We're, we're Golden State fans because we're from the Bay Area, so we, we, but we love the Spurs, too. We love yeah. the way they play. Yeah, we do. Um, you know, we've, we, I actually got to interview Danny Green a couple of years ago. He was super right. cool. Um, and, you know, Dwayne Dedman, he's, 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 he's actually done some videos with us on our channel. Right. Um, so it's, it's uh, you know, we, it's bittersweet for us to watch that. We would love yeah. it if it was Spurs Warriors in the, in the championships. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but, yeah, I don't think they have a good, good chance anymore. Yeah. Um, this one, this one, yeah. The Flipsy says, "Why does my game drop when I play official games? I grew up playing street ball, never team ball." Well, that's the reason right there. They're actually they're basketball, but they're two different kinds of basketball. Um, well, no, no. Here's the thing: is that street ball? It depends on how you're playing it, because street ball can just be competitive basketball. He's not talking about necessarily like you know, uh, you know and one type of basketball. He's well, talking He's talking about just playing basketball. When it comes to official games, a lot of that is just getting experience playing in them and having the right pillars of practice in place where well, you're working on executions and stuff. Well, the, that's the biggest problem yeah. is that that game uh, is organized. Yeah. And um, the, usually the, the other type, uh, street ball or whatever, is not so organized. <clears throat> and so... Um, you know, it's kind of helter skelter sometimes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Ahmed is asking, "Do you guys follow Euroleague?" We don't really. We yeah. don't really get too much coverage of that over yeah. here. Uh -huh. uh, a lot of it. A lot of it is just the NBA, and when the NCAA is going on, we get to watch that stuff. Mm -hmm. So, is, is there anything cool going on in Euroleague? Because we do occasionally, we do catch some of the the highlights and stuff that that kind of uh, go viral. But if if there's stuff that we need to be watching, let us know. Yep. Sam Nestor says, hi. What's hi, up, Sam? Hi, Sam. Um, Bulldog says, what's up from sunny northern Michigan? Is it sunny up there now? Is it sunny there? We I thought they were still in the middle of winter in Michigan. <laughs> no, I just think that's, kidding. I think that's just Colorado. Kidding. Um, it's sunny here, too. Right. Um, Stephen Swish Curry, Swish Curry is from Philadelphia. I think we went through those guys already. Mm -hmm. Let's go here. Let's find another question. Uh, 
Uh, Mino says, when you are in the bucket, for example, when you grab an offensive rebound, when do you fake a player and when do you not? Uh, like faking like you want to go back up and put it in as an offensive rebound? I'm going to say that that probably is what you're talking about. Yeah, I think he means like when you're in the paint and you yeah. go up for a rebound. Yeah, and you get it and you're on the floor. One of the things that we feel is really important is that when you're surrounded or you have other bigs around you, is that you use some kind of an up fake to get them off the floor. One of the things that was a technique that we kind of picked up from the point guard college a couple of years ago, they have a little thing that they do that which, uh, which they teach is that when you up fake uh, around the basket, you up fake and then you say, what's up? You don't have to say it out loud, but that's what's up. And what happens is that that break of time right there allows the other player to elevate and they're beginning to come back down as you're on your way up to finish. And so that's one thing you can do. The other thing that we uh, teach all of ours, we teach everybody the mic and drill. Yeah. And the mic and drill is just super. Uh, and there's some nice history behind that if you check that out. It's named after George Mikan, but the one thing that, that comes out of that Mikan drill is that if I've got somebody behind me and I up fake, or even if I don't up fake, and I do a Mikan step to the other side of the basket, they usually are not able to go with me uh, quick enough. And so we use that a lot too. Yeah, I would just say to keep the ball high. Yep. If you bring the ball down, that's where all the little hands can grab it. Keep it high. And there, there is basically two scenarios that you can do. Is one is you get the rebound and you go right back up, mm -hmm. and you don't wait. You don't bring the ball down. You don't wait, and you go right back up. You just beat them to the punch. Right. Number two is when you do that shot fake, the get them fake. up in the air, and then you put the ball in. Maybe you even get a, an and one in that scenario. Yeah. So those are really kind of the keys to that. Yeah. Um, Mika says, I heard that it would help when you when your heels don't touch the ground when you jump. Is this correct? Well, I mean. That's it's hard to to uh, perfectly explain kind of the biomechanics of that yeah. stuff, but it is good to be in an athletic position and on the balls of your feet. That's exactly. kind of your four feet, yeah. um, and that typically means that you you don't have weight in your heels yeah. um, because you have the dorsiflex to do anything, anyways. So technically, yes, but that doesn't mean that you have to have your heels off the ground necessarily. It just means that your weight or your uh, balance is kind of forward onto your the balls of your right. feet, right? Right. Okay, let's let's kind jump down here. Um, this one is from Poodle Swan, who says, "How to drive past a defender?" Oh, uh, check out our offensive moves playlist. We yes. have a ton. Yeah, there's a whole bunch of them there that explain how to attack a defender. One of the things that we teach everybody is what we call the long one and one attack. Yep. It's a long step and a long dribble, and it's surprising how much I see that in the pro level uh, of basketball. Um, and I see it in college basketball too. I mean, just imagine if you take a tiny little step, you're not going to beat anybody. No. But if you take that big step and push it out, that person has to recover to you. Yeah. Tiny step, easily, easily kind of, uh, they can recover on that. Big step, it's going to be really hard. You take a look at Kevin Durant. Um, in fact, I saw it last night when he attacks somebody from uh, that right elbow and he's out beyond the three line, he is at the basket in uh, one step and one dribble. I mean, it, it, because everything is out there and that usually he can come up and dunk it. Um, and so that really kind of neutralizes the defense. And there's elements there that you have to learn how to do, but that, that's really important. And then going to our, our uh, uh, dribble attacks, uh, there's a whole bunch of that on our, our uh, channel, our uh, YouTube channel. Yeah. And yeah, and, and shotscience.com yeah. too. I think that the, <laughs> the big thing too is not just that long one-on-one, -on -one, but the direction of it too. Oh, yeah. People all the time take these little tiny steps or they take a step that is out to the east or the west. So yeah. side to side instead yeah. of east or north to south where they are going to the basket. Yeah. If you take those tiny steps side to side, the defense just slides over and stops yeah. you. Yeah. Right. But if you take a long north-south step, they have to recover to catch up with you because you're going past them. Well, if you come right off of their hip, even a little contact is good. Uh, but they have to open up their stance. And when they open up their stance, you're already past them. And people want that yeah. quick first step. That's yeah. really what it is. Yes. It, yes. It's not necessarily that it's you know, physically super fast, which helps. Yep. But a lot of times it's just getting out past their foot. Yep. They have to open up and try to catch up with you. By that time, you're already gone. Yeah. 
Um, okay, Zakori easily says, what is the best way to get out of a shooter slump? Just Keep work, shooting. Yeah, just work on, on your shooting and stay with it. Sometimes slumps come about because of some little uh, snag in our mechanics. And one of the things that would help you probably a ton is have somebody take an iPhone or uh, an iPad or something like that and video your shooting from uh, all four sides. And then you go back and analyze that. Uh, we often do that with our students because one of the things we find out is they don't know sometimes uh, kind of the language we're using. We'll tell them, okay, your elbow's out, but they don't know what that means. And so what it means is the elbow turns out to the side like this, and that causes your shot to be really short, or I'm sorry, flat, short and flat. Okay, and so that's an important thing that you need to do is visit your stroke, and what are you doing? Sometimes when we shoot the ball, uh, we elevate our elbow above our eye, but at the very end, we pull our hand down. Well, yeah. when we pull our hand down, the shot flattens out. The whole the basket itself gets smaller because of that. And so those are the kind of things that you want to take and, and address. Yeah, you have to identify kind of the issues that are yeah. going on. Yeah. Uh, if there is no issue and it's a mental thing, you just got to keep shooting and stay positive. One of the worst things you can do as a shooter or any kind of athlete or, or anything really in life is get down in yourself because things aren't necessarily going exactly the way that you want them to go. Right. You know, if Steph Curry or um, well, uh, or any, yeah. of the, any of these guys, well, Kyrie know. Irving or LeBron James, yeah. if they sat there and they just got down on themselves because they had one bad game or because... Or quit shooting because they were not well, shooting. Yeah, well. or shut down because they yeah. missed, you know, they went one for 10 on yeah. three-pointers or something like that. Uh, for one game, if they got down on themselves for that and they didn't just use that as motivation to keep shooting or to keep working to get better, yeah. then they wouldn't be where they are. Yeah. And you can see that all the time in players that are in, in kind of you know youth leagues or that are in school teams and stuff. They are the powders. They're the ones that get down on themselves. They get down on everybody else. They're just negative people. Mm -hmm. And that is just not a good way to advance yourself. And, th yeah. and those people go nowhere. The people that go somewhere are the ones that are like, okay, I'm not shooting great. What am I doing wrong? What can I do to fix it? I'm going to keep shooting. I'm going to turn this around. Yeah. Well, you know, one of the things that's going on right now in the Warriors is, is uh, Thompson is having kind of a tough time with his shooting after really just shooting so well early in the season and last season. Uh, and he's kind of starting to make a little bit of comeback now. But one of the things I heard him say in an interview is uh, he's never going to stop shooting. Uh, that he's going to just keep shooting the ball and he knows that it will come back around again. And that's pretty much the thinking of most of those guys who are true shooters. You and, know? And, and here's another thing, too, is that if you look at any one shooter for a snippet of time, <coughs> doesn't matter who it is, Ray Allen, uh, Reggie Miller, Steph Curry, uh, whoever it is, Michael Jordan, you look at anybody for a little snippet of time you will be able to pick out little snippets where they just shot like garbage. Mm -hmm. And it was, you know, they went oh for whatever. If you look at it over time, those things get smoothed out because they're going to have games where they're pretty much at their average or their median. And then they're going to have ones where they're just way above normal and they're shooting like they are just superhuman. You have to look at it over a longer time period. Maybe you're shooting mm -hmm. like garbage right now, but next week you're going to have like a really up time and then you know you look at it over the, the course of a month and that's just a little blip whatever yep. you're gonna have blips that go the other way yeah so you can't get down on yourself because you you had a bad game or you had just like a, a couple of days where things aren't going your way just just some things to think about yeah okay um manuel soriano says you guys are the best thanks manuel Thank we, you we very really much, appreciate manuel. that we appreciate that um dan lakoti says uh how to memorize and understand offensive plays on a team better you know, that's an interesting question. Uh, one of the things that I found uh, a long time ago is that some players pick that up just very quickly. Other players struggle with that. And I don't know exactly why, but one of the things that happens is that uh, I used to take and have those who are struggling a little bit take and draw the plays out for me. Yeah. And as they draw them out, then we would kind of discuss, okay, do you understand what this guy does and do you understand why you do that? 
Well, not really. Okay, so here's the discussion on that. that. That's the most important part is yeah. knowing why. Exactly. Too exactly. many times you're trying to memorize these tracks. Right. Memorize why because, right. you know, why is that guy setting a screen there? Why is that guy flashing then? Yeah. Well, there's a reason why. That'll help you remember why and it'll also help you kind of understand the opportunity that it creates. Exactly. And one of the things I think probably is really a good idea too is if you're struggling with that, I would chat with the coach yeah and you can see him after practice or before practice and just let him know coach i'm really struggling with these plays i can't really remember what to do and 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 even more importantly like case saying why i need to do that yeah and once you kind of get a feel for that i think your understanding is going to be improved because some people i think just because they understand why and the end product then it all becomes a little clearer for them why they're executing a screen on this guy and they roll to the basket. They're beginning to understand it a little more. Yeah, and Hopefully doing, the, doing the visualizing, visualizing thing is really good too. Yeah. Sit down there, jot them out, know where everybody goes. And why, yeah. why they're going there, yeah. And you know, if you want, you can get one of those uh, little uh, you know, uh, whiteboards that has the basketball court on it. Yeah. You can draw on that. Yeah. Or you can get the magnet one that you move stuff around. That stuff really helps. It's just yeah. figuring out where you have to go. Then you can kind of visualize it yourself. Right. Okay. Um, Deep G asks, how to get free from defenders to lay up or shoot if no one is open? It well, depends. How are they playing you? Are they yeah. are they up on you really closely and tight? Then you just go on them because if they crowd you, mm-hmm. go. Uh, if they're playing off of you, you got to shoot it. If they're playing mid, kind of that mid distance from you, then you need to look at some of the offensive moves that we have in our offensive playlist. Right. I mean, that's that's not a really defined thing on what you should do. If, and also, you want to learn how to play without the basketball, too. <clears throat> that's really imp- yep. important in learning how to do back cuts and L cuts and stuff like that. Okay. Epoy says, opinion on caring too much in the NBA. I'm Ooh. having trouble because I after I watch NBA, I usually imitate their moves and gameplay in a game, and the league that I'm playing in call them as violations. Yeah, I mean... That's the way it is in the NBA. They let them fly with a yeah. lot of, of kind of lenient, uh, you know, yeah. mechanics in the NBA. Yeah, and... Some, I, w- so, oh, go ahead, I was just... Sometimes when I'm watching the games, I will see just horrible traveling calls or non-calls and, and just figure, wow, how can they ignore that? Well, they give those guys an awful, awful lot more freedom uh, than you get. You see them with their hand under the basketball as they're dribbling the ball down the court. No call. Or you watch Shaq and the Fool, and you see that the, they let them do 10 steps <laughs> oh, yeah. without yeah. without a dribble. Yeah. I mean, a lot of it, too, is this, is don't emulate players in the NBA yeah. or any players. Build up from the foundation and become your own player. Exactly You can right. get inspiration from these yeah. people, like, wow, that crossover was really awesome. I'm going to learn how to do that. Start with the foundational elements and then grow up from there. Yeah. Bad idea to emulate people that have different biomechanics, have different bodies, have different, uh, you know, physical properties, uh, whatever, than you. Well, you can't you can't just look at Michael Jordan and think, I'm going to play like Michael Jordan. Yeah. You well, got to work up. One of the things that comes to my mind as Casey was speaking there is this, is how defensive players actually are allowed to mug the offensive player. They hold them, they grab them, they misdirect them, bump them, uh, which is not really a, a, a part of a high school or college game for that much point. When you get into the NBA, they give them a lot more wider um, leeway uh, leeway in, in, in how they call the game. And unfortunately, <coughs> because people like you, uh, and you're not alone, I hear this all the time, uh, people who are trying to mimic the players that are in the pros. Not a good idea. Yep. Um, Brian Kelly says, if you watch the defender's foot, attack his or her front foot quickly. Yeah, if, well, if a lot of times if somebody has a leading or, or has a high foot, yeah. then you attack over the top of that. Right. And that's why when we teach defense, we don't teach to have a high or low foot. No, you're squared up, and both those feet are equal. And, and if they try to attack that, then we can slide a little easier and we don't get caught. Here, one of the things that happened, and I, I don't remember the exact time period that – that coaches started to attack that high foot, probably maybe 40 years, I can't remember now, but <laughs> that what they found is that when you've got that foot forward and you are attacked, you have to make a pivot <coughs> that is going to make you open to somebody getting to the basket. Well, the, that thinking has changed over the last uh, maybe 20 years, 15, 20 years, so that 
coaches oftentimes now will teach the defender to square up so that you don't have a foot extended forward. And, and you're able then to move your feet and stay in front of that defender a little easier. Yeah. Um, okay. This one is from IA Gaming who says, as I said, I'm from Morocco, which is close to Spain because NBA scatters go there. So I'm shooting. I'm, so I'm a shooting guard, six foot one, a great shooter. So can you give me tips about shooting off the dribble and to be unafraid of contact? Okay. To be unafraid of contact, that is a big mental switch that you really have to flip. You got to understand basketball is a contact sport. Yes, it is. And you can use contact to your advantage. You can. A lot of people think it's something that they need to shy away from or whatever. That is the wrong approach. Use it. Draw fouls. Use it to protect the ball. Use it to neutralize the defense. Uh, when you're on defense, use it to neutralize the offense. Uh, there's a lot of ways to use it. You got to first flip the switch to be okay about it. Yeah. Shooting off the dribble, go check out our videos. Uh, we have stuff on shotscience.com, the all access members area, where we talk about that, like how to develop it. We show broken down. Here's how you do the footwork. Here's how you add in the dribble. Here's how you get the shot off. Here's how you progress it to game speed, game intensity. This, this also when you want to release the basketball. Yeah, and, and you those know, we, are all we, important. We things. talk about that last dribble that needs to be a rocket that yeah. helps you get the rhythm for that shot. Check that out. It's too hard for us to go through every detail right yeah. now, but uh, at shotscience.com, we, we go through and show you that. Good research place. Yep. Um, Harry Stairs says, I'm 16. What should I do to improve my defensive IQ? You Play. Got, yep. Play and Experience. listen to coaches and watch other players. You can learn an awful lot from good defensive players by just watching how they use their feet. Uh, which is a key to defense. Yep. You know, people used to think that, you know, had more to do with the hands, but the hands are going to get you in trouble uh, with fouls and whatnot. Your feet are really what are going to make you a better defender well, one of and the things, how you use them. One of the things that you do all the time, and you did when we were kids, is you had us put our hands behind our back, yes. and you should be able to play defense without any hands. And the way that you do that is you use your footwork, you use your feet to cut people off from their mm -hmm. intended path to the basket, you use it to get in the way of them being able to uh, catch the ball in the first place. You use it to just kind of get them to go where you want to go. And one of the things that we always talk about is offensively or defensively, you want to be the one that's in control and dictating what is happening. You don't want to be the person that is reacting. You want to be the one that is acting. Yeah. Okay, so hopefully that will help you a little bit. Um, Mika says, thanks. Thanks to you guys to take the time to answer the questions. You no bet. problem. We like we to do that. We enjoy doing that. Uh, uh, Christian Thompson asks, what are workouts for an explosive first step? Got to work on developing your athleticism. So things like we talk about in the uh, vertical jump videos and the uh, kind of that handbook that we have for that yeah. as well. I think working on your jab step, the mechanics of that, that's really going to help. And then you progress that jab step into the long one and one. Yeah, and you know, I think the real ticket is to use the drills and the exercises that we have in the vertical jump program because they really work on explosiveness, yep. leg explosiveness. And, and uh, you'll find that not only does your vertical improve, but also your speed and uh, uh, explosion uh, uh, on that first step really improves too. All right, you guys, we got tons of questions here. If you okay. really want to get them through, you might want to try out the Super Chat. We've yeah. never tried that before, but if you want to try, uh, we're not going to get to everybody here. Um, okay, Dizon says, when I'm practicing my shot, I'm changing my mechanics from day to day. How do I fix that? Don't change the mechanics from day to day. I mean, that's the key right there. And if your mechanics are, are good... Uh, and you have them well-founded and they're a matter of muscle memory, they shouldn't change from day to day. If yep. they are, you need to go back and take and spend time making sure that you are doing exactly what you need to do every time you shoot the basketball. And, you know... Um, the form shooting drill, foundational elements, yeah, make yeah. sure they're all in place. Yeah, and, and just the repetitive nature of of uh, form shooting really makes that muscle memory start to come around and then you don't start to shoot the bus basketball different every time you go play or every other day. Yeah, I mean, a lot of it comes down to you have to have consistency and repeatability yeah. to have the accuracy. Yeah. And if you don't have any of those elements, then it's gonna be hard to put the ball in the basket. 
So you have to work on things like the form shooting drill. You have to be consistent with it. You have to be diligent and, and purposeful. You have to be analytical and look at what you're doing. Yeah. If your shot is different every day, that is not good. Not good. Not good. You're never going to be a very adequate shooter. What you need to do is create the proper stroke mechanics. Take a step and back. And make it a matter of muscle memory. Yeah, take a step back, slow it down, look at what you're doing. Yeah. Um, okay, Ahmet says, how can I get your shirts? You're doing a great job. Awesome, thank you. Uh, you can go to shotscience.com and you can order your shirts there. Yeah. And yeah. we'd love to see you in them. Tag any social media stuff with hashtag Team Shot Science, and we see all of them. So that, that would be awesome. Um, let's see here. Um, Michael Ming Yuan Lu says, I play with a bunch of friends five on five, and I think I am a bit more skilled than them, but my team always loses. What should I do? I play point guard, by the way. Well, <laughs> I don't know. What do you want to yeah, get out of it? Yeah, yeah. You know, you can only do what you can do. And you can't make them better. They have to work on making themselves better. So that's, that's almost an uh, impossible question for us to answer for you. Just do what you can do. Encourage them to get better so they can do a better job. I, I have no other answer for you. I would say this, too. If you are interested in keeping in advancing your skill level, you probably shouldn't play with people that are less skilled than yeah, you are. That's true. Um, because that isn't challenging you really right so if you are playing with people that are better than you that pushes you to become better so maybe it's fun to play with these guys that's awesome maybe try to find another place that you can play as well or yeah. and just try to kind of push yourself yeah um okay puma faller 23 says quick question do calf raises make you jump higher okay yeah. consider this Cal your calves are probably some of the smallest muscles in your legs. Exactly. Do you think that they are the key to jumping higher? The answer to that is no. And, you know, so many people spend so much time doing calf raise after calf raise after calf raise thinking that's going to help. It. That is one piece of the puzzle. Yeah. Go check out our video on how to develop your vertical jump. We show you that it's, you know, it's, it, you have to do work on the whole package. You can't just work on your quads. You can't just work on your hamstrings. You can't just work on your glutes. It is a concerted effort. Yeah. And if you want to develop a, a vertical, you can't just do one thing. Exactly right. And if somebody tells you that, they're they're telling you the wrong information. Yeah, exactly. Um, okay. Uh, Dan Dabrowski's here. Hey, Dan, what's going on? He's uh, here every week. Uh, yeah, I remember his name. Um, Nuke Gilbert says, my guide hand had a thumb flick. How do I fix that? Get that thumb off there. S okay. S try using the one-handed delivery and work on, on that type of shooting and then add in your assist hand after you kind of get that down. Well, now, you know what's really an anomaly about uh, the wording <clears throat> here, and we don't use it, uh, is the guide hand. And, you know, the guide hand, you would think that would have something to do with guiding the ball to the basket. But in reality, it doesn't. What happens is that usually what happens is the, the thumb on that finger will take and flick the ball as you're ready to release it, and it tends to push the ball right and left. If you shoot the basketball with just one hand, it's incredible how straight the ball will go for you. So we refer to that hand as the assist hand. It's going to assist the other hand, and we're up and we're ready to go, and it releases before the ball is, is comes off your shooting hand. It steps to the side just completely. I mean, okay. if you think about it, it's just another variable, something yeah. that can go wrong, another yeah. input that will mess with your accuracy. You want your shot and your mechanics to be as simple and straightforward as possible. If you're adding in all these other elements, then it's going to be more complex, yeah. more difficult to recreate each time you shoot. Yeah. So you want everything to be the same. You want everything to be simple. And so you want... As soon as this hand is not necessary, which is almost immediately, it falls away. So as soon as you elevate, it falls away. You get in trouble when it starts tracking up and then it becomes part of the shot. Yeah. So you that, want it to fall away. Yeah, that little thumb flick really <clears throat> corrupts the shot. And yes, there are people that have learned how to make the shot with that being part of their shooting. That's because they've spent you know, thousands of hours working on it and made it so that it works for them. But that doesn't mean that's the best way to do it. Yeah. So you need to start with 
the best information you have and you'll cut out some of the learning curve and you'll have a more uh, repeatable, accurate shot. So and that's And remember, it's... You keep pounding right next to the microphone. Right next to the phone. It is assist hand and not guide hand. Yeah. Um, okay, this one is from Darius who says, any tips on good shot fakes? Yes. yes. You have to keep them tight. A yeah. lot of people do way too exaggerated shot, well, uh, shot fakes. A lot of people will drop the ball down uh, to their midsection and give you a big sweeping fake. And what happens is that usually your legs straighten as you do that. And the person on defense, they're going to take and contest, and so their leg straightens. And then for you to recover and get ready to go, it takes as much time for you to recover as it does them, and so you're very ineffective. One of the things that uh, uh, Bobby Knight uh, used to teach was this, is that the ball comes from your uh, chin, and it need, first of all, it needs to look like a shot. And so from the chin, we teach the chin to the hairline, and with just a quick pop, uh, like that and with our eyes at the rim. The eyes at the rim probably is one of the most effective things that you can do because to the defender, you know, people say, well, you're not supposed to watch their eyes, but we all do. Uh, and so as the eyes go to the <clears throat> rim and we give them that little short pop right there, I don't have to recover. And the thing that is important is that you don't straighten your legs when you do that. You're down in your, your stance and it's right here and I'm ready to go. And the, the defender has to take time to get back down, get ready to go, and that's usually where I can get by them. It takes almost nothing to make people jump on that stuff. Yeah. And you want to do the smallest amount possible, the minimal amount to get them to do that yeah. because then, again, less recovery time for you. Right. Um, okay. Where'd Dan Dubosky go? Uh, we already answered Dan's, Did I think. We? Yeah. Um, this one's from Dame Lillard. Oh, really? Hmm. Off season, huh? He says, hey, coaches, unfortunately, my nearest hoop is a little bit shorter than the official height. Do you think I can improve my shot there, or will it even hurt my shot? Yeah. Uh, we've had this question before. Yeah. The thing is, is this, is that whenever you are working on developing your skills, you want to have the tools and equipment that you will see across the board, right. the standard sizes. So, you know, a lot of times people are like, oh, there's a nine-foot hoop uh, at, my, at my school. That's what I use to work on my shot. Well, that's okay but that that doesn't really help you when you have to shoot on the 10 foot hoop and you might in fact develop some bad habits from shooting at the low hoop yeah. because it's lower so maybe you're you're not finishing with a high finish you're finishing with a low finish yeah. that's not necessarily good and there's always going to be that that you might have to overcome and then like the rustiness of trying to uh you know kind of the work back up to the other height so one of the things that we always talk about is the uh figure it out or the make it happen uh and that is where you maybe have to find another place to shoot your shot or yeah. maybe you have to uh get some some uh jobs mowing somebody's lawn and make a little money and maybe you can get one for your driveway yeah. or for you know maybe get together with a group of friends and you guys can get one together or maybe you go find a court that you know doesn't have uh that problem you have to find the equipment and the stuff that will that you'll see as the standard, yep. right? Yep, you do. Uh, and, you know, if, if it's important to you, you'll do that. If it's not, that's okay, too. You can do whatever you want to do. Yeah. Exactly. Um, okay. Uh, Brian Kelly says, should I work on perfecting my role on the team or work on, on oh. skills? You know, my thought on it is this. I would work on all of my skills first. Individual skill development. Yeah, and then um, because you want to develop those, that's going to make you a stronger player. But then follow that up immediately with working on the things of protecting, uh, perfecting your role on a team. I mean, that, they kind of go hand in hand, but I would work on the, the skills first. And then the rest of it probably will fall in place a lot easier for you anyway, and we have better skills. Yeah, yeah. Um... Christian Thompson says, what is the right call for putting the ball in the palm of their hands? Are you talking about shooting? Like, what are you? We don't know. I mean, know if, if you're talking one. about shooting, we don't recommend that. And we, no. we can talk about that if that's what you're talking about. Um, I but a yo toast mm -hmm. says, how do I slide a lot faster on defense? OK, we talked about this, I think, last week or yeah. two weeks ago. But the thing is, is that you need to make sure that you are not bringing your feet too close together every time you step. Right. And when you step, it is this is like a leading foot here. 
It's a step and then drag, step, drag. And you need to make sure that you are not picking that foot up like this and then moving this foot and then putting that one down. You need to make sure that it is stepping with your leading foot and dragging the other one close. And it's always keeping that distance. So your step, drag, step, drag. And if you, if you step and you bring your feet together, what happens is your center of gravity comes up. So if I'm here playing defense and I take a step and then I stand up and bring my feet together. You can see how I went up and down. That's like the inchworm. You don't want to do that. Yeah. You want to stay down, step, drag, step, drag. See how my center of gravity never changes. It never goes up and down. That makes you much quicker. Yeah. Okay. Um, let's see. This one is from Darius. He says, thank you, coaches. One more question. I'm having struggles at the line as I'm fixing my mechanics and my jump shots are improving as my free throw percentage is going down. Overthinking at the line? Could be. Yeah, you know, uh, there's several things at the line that I see people do that, that I don't recommend. Number one is they get to the line and they spend too much time there. There actually is a time limit by rule that you only have 10 seconds in order to shoot that basketball. And some people stretch that uh, out. And when I see somebody that's playing and taking a long time at the free throw line, I just know they're probably not going to shoot the ball very well. And so what you need to do is we have this little uh, thing that we do. Uh, everybody has a, um, a, pro a program. Routine, yeah. Uh, when they come up there, they bounce it twice, they wrap it around their back once, whatever. And what you want to do is relax. And the best way to relax is take a deep breath all the way in and then take and blow it all the way out and then take a half breath. Okay, and now you've had a chance to relax and you've probably been about three seconds and then let's go. Don't sit there and think about it and cogitate because you can, I can almost call it. You just that, ice that they're gonna, Yeah, you're not going to make the basket. Yeah, and here's, here's another thing too. I will, I'll say something on routine. Uh, a lot of people, they want to have like this performance that they put yeah. on before yeah. that they, they shoot the shot. You know, they, yeah. they're, do, they're tapping their shoulder. They're going around their back. They're doing some you know, globetrotter moves, and then they shoot their shot. I think that's a mistake. I think the best thing you can do is, again, keep it as simple as possible because that's repeatable yeah. and it's consistent. And uh, you know, if, if you're trying to do all this stuff, you, you can, you can just ice yourself because you're trying to do this routine that you do. Right, right. I know for me, when I get to the line, I don't step to the line until they give me the ball. And then once I get the ball in my hands, I step to the line. I never look at the basket. I don't look at it. I know where it is. So I don't look at it. I, I have the ball. I dribble twice. One, two, rhythm dribbles. One, two, and then I go straight up into the shot. And as I'm going up, that's when I look at the basket because I don't want to like focus on that thing and ice myself because I was looking at the basket yeah. the whole time. So if you can keep it simple and you can make sure that you're not doing things that are, that are icing you, that also helps so that if you're not looking at the basket, you look up and then that cues you so you're not thinking about your shooting mechanics either. Yeah. So that's, that's just some, some of my personal right, tips. Right. Keep it simple. Um, Hassan, Hassan Nain asks, should I first build a good form shooting before I do all the other advanced shots, like behind the back pull-ups and et cetera? <laughs> Holy moly. Oh, no question. And you know, a lot of those uh, uh, kind of behind the backs and all the rest of that, um, there's that, probably not that much uh, usefulness in them. Um, what you want to do is you want to be effective uh, in number one, getting ready to shoot the basketball and then <clears throat> getting into the act of shooting and then the actual stroke mechanics. That's way more important than all of the hoopla. In fact, we often call that uh, uh, the dribble dance where we get in and we've got all that stuff. And, and usually when you're involved in the dribble dance uh, before you shoot, you miss the shot. Okay. Yeah, here's the thing. If you have to do this whole kind of song and dance or performance before you can get a shot off, that's not a good shot. No. You have to figure out how to create space to get open shots. Um, so, yes, you, number one, have to develop your shot without any of the other accoutrement stuff going mm -hmm. on. It has to just be you have to have a good sh jump shot. Uh, and then after that, you can develop things like a step back or a dribble attack into a shot or whatever. But you don't want to complicate things by uh, taking bad shots. Circus shots, trick shots, uh, you know, all of that stuff, th that doesn't help you in competitive yeah, basketball. Truly, truly. 
Um, Angelina Schaefer says, what are ways to work on your jump shot? We have a billion of them. Yeah. If you check out uh, all of our videos on shot science, or you know YouTube shot science, and if you go to shotscience.com, we have uh, the all access members area where we talk about how to develop it from the very beginning all the way up to advancing to game speed, game intensity, yeah. game execution stuff. Okay, so that's going to do it for us today, you guys. We have two questions for you though, and I got to think of the second one while I'm asking you the first one. <laughs> so the first question is. Where in the world are you guys from? Yeah. We want to know where you guys are. We are in Santa Cruz, California. We know that there's people here from Ireland. There's people here from Morocco and Saudi Arabia. And uh, what were some other ones? Oh. Uh, Buenos Aires. We want to know where you guys are from. Yeah. So please let us know down in the comments. And also, number two, we talked about how to develop deep range today. We want to know what is the deepest shot that you've made in your life in a game. In the uh, game, yeah. So please let us know what is the deepest shot you've made in a game and tell us a little story about it. We want to know. Um, okay, so make sure you guys follow us on all of our social media stuff. We are Shot Science on everything, whether it's Instagram, Snapchat, Facebook. Follow us. We are Shot Science. Go to ShotScience.com. You can get the all-access membership area. You can also get some Shot Science gear like our shirts or our training materials. Mm -hmm. And uh, we will see you guys next time. All right. Thanks, guys. And if we didn't get to your question today, it's not because we don't like you. It's because we ran out of time. All right. See you later.